Freeman, most people think that um, the next presidential election is the future. Uh, <laughs> some people think that maybe you can go 10 years or 20 years into the future. A few can go 1,000 years. You've gone further in your thinking that, that then you even can put a name to a number. You have to use exponents to really describe the time that you've looked to. Um, I, I have been entranced by it. Uh, when, when did you begin to think so far into the future? So I, it came mostly from Jamal Islam, who is a, a, a Bangladeshi. In fact, I mean, he's still alive and well, living in Chittagong in Bangladesh. Mm. He's one of these people I admire very much who went back to his own country when he could have had a more comfortable life here. And, but he was the one who first got me thinking about the far future. He wrote a book about it himself. It's called the, the Far Future of the Universe or something of that kind. And So anyway, he came here to the Institute in Princeton and, and uh, got and told me what he was thinking about. And so everything really came from him. He's a very, very highly original man, unfortunately not well known because... Because he's in Bangladesh, of course, yeah. he's, he's hard to reach and the, the email is not very good. Yeah. <laughs> but he, he's, he's, he, he says he has a wonderful life there, that Bangladesh is one of the places where, where poets and scientists re really are respected. Mm. And he's, uh, he's a little bit of both. <laughs> so when, when did you first begin thinking and writing about the far, far future? So this was about 30 years ago, mm. I suppose. And... So I, I sort of I make a distinction between sort of four uh, futures. The first, the, the future of the solar system, which is say one thousand years, when h humans will uh, life will, will bring the solar system to life, and and so we we are more or less spread over the solar system. A million years it'll take roughly to spread over a galaxy. So you can imagine life no longer human, but spread over the galaxy. A billion years would be roughly how long it will take for life to spread over the universe. I mean, give or take a factor of 10. And, and, mm -hmm. and then, so that the fourth future is after that, after the, the <laughs> present universe has passed away, when the stars have faded, when things are getting colder and colder and less and less is happening, can life survive then? And that's the problem I was addressing. So, so it's a future unimaginably distant. In, in long compared even with the lifetime of galaxies and stars, when essentially all that's left is, is a, a, a few black holes, a, a few lumps of iron which used to be planets, and the remnants of stars, and perhaps some very dilute plasma, and that's it. And the question is, can life adapt to that kind of, of an environment? I think it could. And the question is how, and the question is how much, and the question is how long. So that's what I was writing about. First Islam, and then, then, and then I. And uh, there have been other people involved in the game, of course. What are some of the ways that life could survive in such an, an environment that is so radically different from anything we know? The, the, the best way to look at this, I think, is through science fiction, that... Uh, there have been a lot of science fiction books written about the far future. And one of the best is The Black Cloud, which is a book of Fred Hoyle, who was a famous astronomer mm. and also a good writer of fiction. And The Black Cloud is a story about a form of life, which is simply a, 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 a cloud of dust grains, which floats around th through space. And the dust grains are in communication through electric and magnetic fields. So instead of nerves and muscles and brain, it just has uh, patterns of electric and magnetic fields. So the advantage of that, of course, is it can be as cold as it wants. That, that It's not dependent on liquid water for its functioning. So these dust grains could be essentially at, at zero temperature and the thing can still function. So as the temperature gets colder and colder, the cloud has to expand gradually and grow a little bit larger so that the, the fields become weaker, but they still are able to be organized in some fashion which uh, could, could, could uh, perform <laughs> mental functions and carry information and memory. So that this creature could, in, in fact, exist as a living creature, even un under these very bleak conditions. 
Well, of course, uh, Hoyle made a story out of this. And the black cloud actually came in, into our solar system and began wreaking havoc <laughs> and began sucking energy from the sun. But uh, anyway, the general idea, I think, is a good one, that, that life could, in fact, be radically different in its embodiment and still have the same kind of mental processes that we could recognize. So what would that mean, for example, the the, t- the temporal structure of a, of a thought? I, my thoughts maybe are a couple every second I can have a thought, but the entity that might exist in this far future with only random electromagnetic magnetic radiation there, how long would a thought take? So that is an interesting question, of course, because uh, the, it, it, the thoughts would have to slow down as, as the temperature falls and as the, the cloud expands physically, it becomes bigger and bigger, mm. so that the, the, each thought would probably be something like the time it takes for electromagnetic signals to travel from one side of the cloud to the other. Mm. So it might be seconds, it might be hours, it might be years. Of course, the creature has infinite time, so it doesn't mind being slow. (laughs) From the point of view of the creature, I mean, a thousand years are are just but as yesterday. (laughs) That sounds almost biblical. It is biblical. (laughs) So the unit of time is set by the creature's own consciousness, so it, it it can be as slow as it needs to be. And can this literally continue forever, or is it there a time when when the, there'll be such dispersion among this random radiation as the universe expands and accelerates its expansion that that, that there's there's light years between every every uh, photon? Is it conceivable that it, it could go forever? It's conceivable. The, 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 the question whether the universe expands exponentially, of course, is very important. Now we have this thing called dark energy, which means the universe has been observed to be expanding in the past. Mm. We don't actually know whether it will continue expanding in the future, sure. and whether it will be exponentially expanding or linearly expanding as we thought before. So I was assuming a linear expansion just for the sake of being simple. Mm and not that it has to be so. And if it is a linear expansion with the universe just continuing to expand as we observe it now, then we can, then life can, can in principle, continue forever. If the, if, if, if the expansion is exponential, then we can't. Then that's bad news for life. Mm. So that, that, of course, remains to be seen. So my arguments don't apply if the expansion is exponential. In that case, and everything disappears over the horizon, you're left in this very unhappy situation where you have your own little galaxy and the whole of the rest of the universe has gone over the horizon and is out of contact. So you have absolutely no information, whatever, what might be happening over the horizon. Mm. So it's a very claustrophobic kind of universe. Mm. So I hope that's not the one we're in, of course. (laughs) You've looked at some more recent possibilities in terms of looking out in the universe and and looking for the possibility of life and what might be out there could reflect about what is in our future. And in your vision that you've used, you've, you've talked about different kinds of civilizations and what civilizations might do to harness the power of the a star or a whole galaxy. So uh, help me understand that thinking. Yes, well, this is short-term thinking. This is not about the very far <laughs> right, future. Right, this is right. only just the future of a galaxy or, 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 or something billions of billions of that years, scale. Yeah. No, millions, maybe, or billions. Anyhow, no, those three kinds of civilizations were invented by a friend of mine, a man called Nikolai Kardashev, who's mm. a Russian astronomer, uh, mostly a radio astronomer. So he had this idea a long time ago maybe 50 years ago, I don't know. Anyway, uh, that there might be three kinds of civilizations. The first kind that exploits the energy of a planet, which is roughly the stage we are in, which he called type one. And then there was the kind that exploited the energy of a star, like the sun, which he called type two. And so, and, and that, so that means sort of roughly a trillion times as, 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 as big a population a trillion times as, as as much energy available, so it's a huge step from type one to mm. type two. So that it, and, and so the question which he raised was, can we actually detect type two civilizations out there in space? 
which is something that I've been very much interested in. So we have been trying to do that in a modest fashion. Mm -hmm. And then he also had type 3, which is when the civilization has grown to the scale of a galaxy. So it's another factor of a trillion more, more than a star. So that would take you probably billions of years to get that mm. get to that point. Mm. So with another factor of a trillion, then the whole galaxy will come alive. Mm. So we have no evidence that <laughs> something like that exists.